So welcome um, and welcome to tonight's panel. So this is a bit different than our normal uh, events. We will not have a presentation. We have an open discussion. A um, couple of weeks ago, Hui Lin, who is also on this panel tonight, uh, came to me and asked me, hey, I have an article here, which is interesting, um, which was basically a McKinsey study uh, about uh, how developer empowerment uh, is uh, the foundation of developer success, which in turn, again, is the foundation for business success. So no business success without developer empowerment. And one of the uh, points that leads to developer empowerment is, the, um, is uh, furnishing your developers with world-class tools and giving them some freedom to choose their tools for the job. And that led, led to the topic of this panel. So how does your company, how do enterprises in general um, handle the, the freedom of choice of the right tool for the job? Because that's an issue. Tools cost money. There are legal considerations of using open source software, for example. There are all kinds of license management things, uh, especially large enterprises like to know what they're using. And if you are developing products and want to sell them as, a, as your intellectual property that has all kinds of legal implications, if there are different open source licenses involved in libraries from other people. So it's not quite as easy as it sounds. And the larger the enterprise, the more complicated it gets because the more people are involved in that decision process from the developers, obviously, but all the way to procurement, uh, legal management, and all that security, the data protection officers, and all the other people that make a large enterprise. So that's the short introduction to this um, panel. Let me just introduce our main panelists um, and they can introduce themselves in more detail. We have Hubert Kut, who is solution architect for Atlassian stuff at eBay. Um, we have Christian Reichert from Resolution, who is CEO and founder of Resolution GmbH. Um, and in his former life had quite a few management roles in organization, development organization and consulting organizations of all sizes. So he brings that perspective. And uh, the last of our main panelists is a returning customer, so to speak. It's Peter van der Vode, who most of you know from Atlassian. So he was um, developer relations at Atlassian and he's now the global director of developer community thingies, I don't know, management or whatever, Programs. at MongoDB, at MongoDB. So um, he knows quite a lot of developers and has a lot to do with developers. And so with that, without further ado, I would hand over to the um, main panelists and starting with first name in alphabetical order, Christian, why don't you take it away? <laughs> <laughs> I actually would have suggested uh, Peter because um, I think um, <clears throat> looking at MongoDB, um, he's in, in a prime role in terms of um, um, helping developers to, to be successful. But um, yeah, let me start off maybe a little bit more controversial than um, most of us will see this topic. Um, I feel a little bit in IT, we tend to have this, um, oh, this is a great idea. Let's go there, let's go there, let's go there. Over rotate and then go a little bit back in, in the principle. Um, so um, if you look at um, IBM mainframes, that was probably the, um, um, the, the, the um, best example of a architecture. And you had sort of server uh, client, a lot into our fat clients and then thin clients again. So uh, we do have those um, swings back and forth in terms of different architectures while still moving forward quite a bit. I mean, today's IT is nothing compared to us. It's much more advanced compared to what mainframes have been, no question about it. And to me, it feels a little bit like that with uh, um, developer empowerment and, and this particular um, study as well. So um, um, I absolutely did not like um, have many things in the spreadsheet um, and cut and paste um, data um, into um, um, two or three applications which weren't really good for the job. But personally, I'm also not 
the big ten of uh, I have like four hundred different applications um, uh, doing all only a, a tiny slice. Um, so I think, um, and, and that feels like with a lot of cloud applications in the world, we are much more in um, uh, at the moment. And I think the, the more interesting long-term solution will be um, uh, getting sort of to, to the middle of having a set of applications um, that work for me that are highly integrated. And that's great to see some of the no-code platforms or Sapia, those kind of things, but also um, develop the tools to easily integrate and synchronize applications um, nowadays. So I don't think none of us want to spend their day in 40 different applications doing time here, but if you can spend your day in three, four, five applications really supporting you well and um, allowing you to share data very easily with someone else, which might be working in a different applications, um, that's really what we are aiming for or what we should be aiming for in the long term. And then you limit some of those challenges um, um, that you've described with um, legal and data protection and all of these things as well, because then you still don't have a zoo of 400 applications, uh, but maybe more 30, 40 in a, in a larger enterprise. Um, yeah, um, there I think it's very important to make that as easy as possible. And um, that is where a lot of the steps of making um, developers being able to have uh, easy APIs, easy integrations, and not always have to start from scratch again, um, absolutely makes sense. And it's very important so that they can actually um, concentrate on making the business logic happen um, as opposed to um writing boilerplate code or reinventing the wheel of um a lot of different things so maybe that's sort of um my view in in like two minutes um and um yeah who wants to go next hubert okay so hubert um you are the master of or the, the lord and king of 16,000 Atlassian users at eBay. So uh, you get requests every day and maybe several every day for new tools. Here's a new add-on that I want or I have this new CI thingy. And uh, you talked about uh, in, a, in a previous event about the Trello movement that started within eBay that people want to use Trello instead of Jira and then doing their own stuff. So how do you handle that without, uh, how do you handle empowerment of your teams without uh, getting into a zoo or into chaos um, and getting into that, that situation that Christian just described, that you have 400 applications and you don't know what they do, basically. Yeah, so inside eBay and eBay classified groups, we have like, I would say even thousands of different applications and you need to even uh, know a little bit more about the structure about eBay. So we have not only eBay incorporated that American platform, but we have also different platforms all over the world. For example, Mobila DE in Germany or Marca 10 L in Netherlands. So overall, we, the idea of our enterprise is that we have each platform has its own freedom about choosing the tool. However, we have a department that I'm part of engineering support, which is more like global provider of tools that support development and all the CI CD processes. And it's like across all platforms. So let's uh, show me an example. So for example, if you have Mobila DE, you can run your own tool stack but you are maintaining it yourself. However, if you don't have a people or if you don't want to do that, you can reach out to my tool, engineering support team, and then you can uh, ask us for help and we will provide our tool. So for example, we can provide uh, uh, you our Jenkinses for building and uh, also about Jira. So, so about Atlassian tool stack, imagine that inside eBay, eBay classifies groups and eBay incorporates. We have 13 Jira instances. Some of them are cloud, some of them are server. However, we have the two main ones. So each of them is 10,000 people. So one is mostly for people like and user inside United States. And the second one is more like for Europe plus Canada plus Australia. 
And yeah, I, I always like uh, mm, saying that, I'm always saying that people should choose the tool that will solve their problems because like putting from the top, like you need to use that tool and that's the only tool that you should use will not work, especially in 21st century. The tools, technology is changing all the time. We have a different even languages, scripting languages every year. So imagine like 10 years back, who would think that the servers will run in Docker and uh, Kubernetes and so on. It was, it, it didn't exist at that time. So to, to keep up running and it's all about the time to deliver to the market. And so the tools should give you possibility to achieve your goals, not other way around. So I always saying also that tools will not solve your problems. Tools will help you to solve your problems, but you need to solve them as the fool with a tool is still a fool. So, so, so that's the, the, the motto that I always say to people. But remember about one important thing that it's easier if you have somebody that knows the tools and it's like company wide use, because probably the issue that you will encounter somebody had already, and we can easily help you with that. And we have our best professional people, like for example, Jenkins, we have a specialist that can solve it. But if you want to go for Team City, go ahead, try. And, and if you uh, like it, it's your choice. So how it works, but also you need to remember about the budgeting and so on. So if we all have that company wide tools, we have a mostly unlimited licenses and, and so on. So you don't need to stretch your budget for your own tool. So, but as I said, each platform has its own freedom. It's nice if you want to use the global one, but you are not pushed like from the uh, leadership team. And also, it's really important that in eBay currently we are stressing a lot about security because I think that's the main topic of 21st century security of your organization, using the proper tool to checking the vulnerabilities like and implement all that automated um, uh, tools and processes that will help you to be secured. Like you have plenty of new companies that are nearly created every year. I would say the big players that are helping you to stay secure because you know, having any uh, breach in your security will cost you really like a lot of money. And I think there are like a lot of presentation how much company lost due to the leak of the the user data, for example, and especially currently with when the road uh, GDPR was implemented in Europe, it's even worse. So it will cost you more if you have any leakage of, of user data. So security is the 21st century uh, main goal and also for eBay. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So maybe I will give the uh, voice to Peter now. Yeah, Peter, MongoDB. Um... So you have, I guess, two situations. You, you meet a lot of developers, obviously, and have met a lot of developer organizations in your life. But MongoDB is also in that position that many large companies have large relational databases. And then a developer finds this groovy, non-relational database, which is so much easier and has a smaller footprint. And hey, boss, I want to use this database. So that's a situation where that happens, obviously, quite often with your products. So uh, what are your experiences from the field, so to speak? Uh, I can look at this in two ways. Like one of them is indeed, we sell MongoDB non-SQL database where uh, we uh, indeed have to come into a market where it's mostly relational, relational uh, databases like Oracle and those kind of things. Uh, what we do there is we mostly ask the question, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And then we look at a solution and how we can help with that solution. As a tool, that's what we do. Uh, from a developer point of view and then how we do it at MongoDB and how I've seen it done millions of times is there are a couple of considerations. Like developers like to new, use the new and shiny things. There's a new framework out there. There's a new library out there. They've built their own library because that's the not invented here syndrome. I think I can do this better because I'm a developer. All of those things happen. And that's, that's wonderful to see. But from a company's perspective, and I have to agree with Hubert there, 
we need to think about security, especially in this GDPR times, especially in these, like everybody's aware about data security, data sensitivity. Everybody's aware about how social media influences uh, our lives and how it uses data to do this. So everybody's very, very careful with this now. And what we do and what I see being done is, if you're a developer, you're starting a new project, take a look at the tools we already have. Take a look at the tools that have been approved by security. Take a look at the tools that have been approved by uh, our, um, that are being used by the other teams. If none of those tools solve your problem, re take a really good look at your problem and your possible solution again. Get some input from other people first before thinking, I either need to build something new or I need to use this new library or this new programming language just because. 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 10 of 100%, your, solu your solution might not be the only one and there might be a solution that you can actually apply that's already using the tools your company knows and your uh, team members know. In case this isn't working out, then you can take a look at the new tools, but you should go through at least some procedure around security, like have somebody review this library and take a look at how well supported is this tool? Is there a community? I'm a community person. Is there a community behind this tool where you can go and ask questions, get feedback, get insights? Is it open sourced? What's the license? Because if you're building a for, for profit products, you need to watch out with your licenses you're using because there might be certain licenses that say like, you have to make your code open source, otherwise you can't use our code. All of those things you need to take into account as, as a developer. For your own personal projects, go wild. Use whatever you want. And honestly, when I started developing and my first ever development project was a website, a website about World War II airplanes, because I, was, I really, really liked those little scale models and I wanted to do a website about them. And I built this entirely in Notepad and in Pico, depending on which operating system I was working on. It worked fine. Like that was a tool for me at that time for the job and I could have used any other kind of tool. It works for you. If it works for you, that's fine. For a personal project, once you're looking at a company-wide project or even like something that might grow into a big project for your company, you need to start thinking about the big picture and start thinking about what are the tools we've already using? How can I solve this problem with those tools? If I need a new tool, who do I need to get on board to make sure this is the right tool for our company? for policies and all of those things. There's a lot of things happening here. And of course, like a choice between Jira and Trello, that's not really a choice, like that's, that's totally fine. But a choice between uh, Kotlin and C Sharp, that's already something different. Different licenses, that's something else we need to start talking about. But, and then that's where I see this, these kind of differences. For your own personal projects, go wild. Just watch out what you download. For your uh, professional projects, always cooperate. You're part of a bigger team. Don't go in freestyle and think, I'm going to build all of this. Unless you're absolutely sure you love this kind of stack, you want to work your entire life on this stack, and you want job security. Then, of course, you should build something on a very weird library that nobody else gets that's super important for your company because then you've got job security. Although I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, and if you're the team leader, then you should fire that guy. Yes. Yeah. And that, that gets me to the, the kind of workflow that you establish. I mean, the tool market today is very enticing. It's, it has never been easier than, than now just to download something and you can basically run your whole stack on your laptop. You don't need any resources from IT from IT, you can basically have your whole test and development environment on your laptop. And after six months of, uh, I don't know, isolation, you basically come out and say, ta-da, here's my new thing that I built and now use it and sell it. And, and by the way, that's a vital component of our next product. So you have to use it. So what's your flow? So you, can, you can't obviously lock down a developer's notebook. That's, that's a no-go. That's impossible because then they have to stop developing. So you can do that in a bank with somebody, but what does the flow look like? So how do you go about or what have you seen? 
how do you how do how do you um, encourage developers to come out with that and have a kind of peer review process to to check all those things, license security and everything, without locking everything down? I think it starts with educating your developers and, and around processes, like set processes in place, educate them about sharing early and quickly. Like, look, this is a new idea I'm having. These are the tools I'm setting up to do it. What do you all think? It's, a, it's an agile approach. <clears throat> do daily standups, for example, or weekly standups. Do one-on-ones if you're the manager. Do regular one-on-ones with your, with your people and see what are you building? What are you working on? How does this fit into the bigger picture towards our goals? If somebody's being able to actually work six months solely on their own, on their laptop, on something mission critical, there's a bigger problem in your company than the tools they chose. Because then there's no, there's no communication happening, there's no accountability happening. And if this happens, I would say that's an awesome uh, proof of concept. Now let's go and rebuild it in our actual technology stack. But that's just my opinion. Anybody else? So, for example, in, in oh, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, mm. So, for example, in in eBay, there is nothing like that that you are locked for six months alone and nobody knows what you are doing. Like as uh, Peter said, we have also agile uh, methodologies implemented. So we have iteration. We are presenting. We are delivering the small parts of the product. And we have always like the project team, at least two, three people that are involved and know what's going on. And also we really like to do brainstorming and thinking and the most important challenging, why we do that, for whom we do that, and do we really need that what we are doing? So that's the main three questions that we always ask during the first like brainstorming before we starting to do anything like any kind of project, because we need to know why we are doing that because we are spending our time which are resources we are we could do something else and maybe we are doing something that it's already exists because you, you need to understand that in the 16,000 people organization you are not aware what's there so that, that could be some other team somewhere located that work already on that maybe it's just about collaboration maybe you just need to know the people that work on something like that it's extremely difficulty to find that i know that because there are too many people too many projects and there is no one like central point of view for everything that you can just type it i want to do that and then you will find it we have of course we have a knowledge base everything but still duplication of work is something that appear inside ebay and i think you can't avoid that or there is no company that i know that are not duplicating the work because over 10,000 people, there is always like two teams. Like imagine why we have 13 Jira instances. So you, you can answer your question because there are some small teams, 100 people or 50 people, and they decided that they don't want to follow the general rules and they have just small cloud instance for, for them or for external uh, collaboration or something. But that's a different topic. But overall, it's important about the keyword is like to, to, to always think why we are doing that and what we will bring but it's it's all about the the core values of agile and of course agile is not solving all your problems but it can help you out with with, with at least that kind of situation christian What's your yeah, I, th I think I, I would have had a similar answer. I think the methodology is, um, is one of the key points there. Um, um, and methodology and tools are some, somewhat independent. Yeah, I can run agile on, on a piece of paper uh, if I wanted to. It might not be the most efficient way of doing it, but um, it, it definitely works. And if you have a methodology or a um, approach in, in the company to have regular communication, um, and um, also set some of the standards that you like to have, like um, peer review, like a release process or peer review before you release or check-in that a regular so, um, source control like Git so that they're regular um, check-ins that features get their own branches. So th there are multiple methodologies that you can choose, but I think it's important that you choose one. Um, and that alone then um, uh, should help you avoid this go into hiding 
in six months. And also that should avoid you, uh, someone picking up a technology stack that no one else has seen because of that um, communication is, um, is going on and people are used to it. Um, then the question of a technology stack of a library and those kind of things um, uh, will come up in those meetings and will get discussed by other people um, uh, who are opinionated about it. Um, obviously, as a larger company, um, you might have um, a bit more structured kind of quality gates or processes around it in terms of license reviews with legal and that stuff um, to enforce. But um, the method uh, methodology in, in small teams, I think that's already the, the biggest um, start and gets you probably 78% there already. So uh, just a reminder to everybody, your microphones are open. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to jump in um, or something to say. Um, my next question would be, um, does it help you? Do you have, um, is, or let's put it another way. Is this a fixed part of any retrospectives or something that you are doing? And uh, how much do you miss your offices for these kind of tool retrospectives or whatever? So how much, uh, what did you have to do to uh, establish processes in the new normal in the virtual world to keep track of all that? Or what, is that easier today than it was in an office environment? Whoever wants to go first. If it's a stupid question, so just I tell me so and then. ask another one. <laughs> Uber. So, so I, we had recently in, inside our team retrospective. So yeah, in new reality, you need to find yourself first of all. And we had already two of them so because we have that uh, either uh, quarterly or half yearly. And the first one was really terrible because people couldn't like adjust to new reality about muting and discussion and so on. But second one was much better. So it's always about evolution and adapting. So as human being, you adapt, you can adapt to any kind of conditions. And uh, yeah, there are some tools that are helping you. So we uh, are using during the retrospective Miro, which is really cool tool for 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 sharing ideas, making the stick notes and everything. Really cool one. And yeah, we, we have always like agile coach who like, uh, empower us and uh, help us to 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 find and uh, like um, involved in the discussion because that's also a difficulty when you are like you know on camera some people are you know staying silent because in in the office it's much easier to to just uh, ask people what do you think about that so with camera it's a little bit different assume, because there's no human uh, interaction but yeah so so first one was like more like learning and adapting. We spent a lot of time on tooling and learning what you can do that and something didn't work, but the second one was much better. So Frank can also say because Frank was also uh, is part of my team and we have we have always like retrospective together. So so I would say that the second one was was really cool. It's different, so you can't say it's the same like being in the office locked in the room, but I think it can help you and help your team to find the issues and uh, make an action point out of it, how to improve the stuff. So, so, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can say a word or two to that. So the, the first uh, retrospective, retrospective we had with Miro was uh, also kind of like intro introduction to the team with a new tool. So everyone was playing around and learning and finding their way. Uh, so it was like a nice experiment because we like mostly were uh, new to that tool. So we had like maybe like one or two uh, touch points with Miro before, but that was a nice introduction and an actual use case. So it was not just we hopping onto a new platform and playing around. So we play, played around with a purpose. So we had an actual guy there who uh, told us what to do and uh, we uh, found our way. So we communicated and that's why also the second one was like way more productive than the first one. Um, but we all went in with an open mind. So we didn't say, okay, no, I prefer that tool. I don't want to use this tool. So we just tried to find our way. 
uh, and that is also a, a good mentality uh, I think we have in the team, which is like really helping uh, to adjust to new conditions and to uh, use new tools and to implement them into our workflow. So we're not like fixed to a particular tool stack. Uh, we try to be adaptive and see what's the best uh, tool for the job. That's it. And Peter, have you seen changes where where companies went from a, a rather strict control of their tool sets to adopting a more agile approach to that? Is that? Have you seen something like that? And have you seen changes because of that? Because you see a lot of different organizations, I guess. Yeah, I would say across the last 15 years, I've seen this move from a top-down decision saying like, these are the tools we're going to use, period. And this is the stack often like, figured out by architects. That was like the entirely different role. They just, they, those were the people who decided on the tech stack and that was it for everybody. So more on a bottom up approach, like teams deciding on, look, these, this is the stack that works for us. Others in the company are already using this. We'll figure it out. So you've got more tools and different configurations. You don't have everything, but there's a more flex, there's more flexibility happening. That's for sure. This is both uh, a curse and a blessing. A blessing is you get better tools to do the job. And then often those tools are uh, newer and are inter more interesting. So it's easy to hire engineers because engineers always want to work with the latest tools. So see, then you can sit, look, look, work with the newest libraries, the newest frameworks, the newest languages. The problem is maintaining some of those things because if you go specifically deep on a certain tool, a tool stack and then the people who implemented it move on to other jobs in, inside the company or to other companies, you still need to find people who can maintain this. And so there's this fine balance between those two you need to find. And I'm seeing the companies being more and more successful at this. Often you see startups are more disruptive saying, let's just go whatever we have. We'll build something, a proof of concept. We'll see if it works. If it works, we can always rebuild it in another stack. Of course, if you're a bigger like company like MongoDB, Atlassian, eBay, uh, you've got your stack and it's very, very difficult to suddenly change this. And you can start talking about microservices and like completely follow it, break it up into microservices and you can like rebuild each of those services. That is of course possible, but for a big company, that's much more difficult and there's much more like anxiety around these kind of things. Uh, because it's a whole process. And then you're talking, once again, you're talking about processes, methodologies on doing this. I also want to touch on your previous question around remote working. So I've been working remotely for five years. I've been managing a team across 17 time zones for five years. Even then COVID-19 is difficult because what we used to do both at Atlassian and now at MongoDB is get together in person at least once a quarter. Because even if we have inter regular interaction over Zoom, I mean, some of my team members, I have daily interactions over Zoom. It is not the same thing as being physically at the same location even for things like uh, brainstorm standups, uh, uh, fiscal year planning, all of those things are doable with tools like Miro, with tools like Mural, with tools like Trello, Jira, Confluence, it's possible, but it doesn't completely replace the ability of just being in the same room for a couple of hours, really focused with a whiteboard, talking things through, and then having dinner and a beer afterwards or whatever your preferred beverage is. And that's the one part I'm, I'm missing here. Like I'm totally fine with Zoom. I'm happy I can work from home and I can just do my job even in these troubling times. But like, that's the one part I'm missing. I'm not missing the travel. I don't miss sitting in a steel tube for so many hours traveling to another side of the world where I'll be, feel jet lagged for most of the week and then coming back. But I do miss that human interaction with my team. Christian, a question for you because you are, as I, if I, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you are coming more from the management side of things or have been in that role for a longer, longer time than the others. Um, I wanted to have somebody here from legal and procurement for this whole stuff, but uh, so you have to fill that gap, sorry. Um, but oh uh, I guess <laughs> uh, retrospectives, retrospectives and all that stuff in Agile is very easy with developers and development organizations. But at some point, you have to call the, the lady, the person the, from legal and have to ask them, 
hey, we have a new tool, can we use that? Or does that uh, wreck our licensing agreement? Sorry for asking. So that's. Hmm. Yeah, um, oh, that's uh, not an easy question to answer. Um, in my career, I've seen um, probably two or three approaches. Um, uh, one, and that's probably more common than you would think, um, and that may be part of the reason why business still works, is um, you do stuff and then you ask for forgiveness later. Yeah. So um, essentially, um, uh, yes, it would be a very sensible process to um, ask legal before you deploy the next software or to get your procurement um, team involved um, before you um, sign a agreement um, that stuff. And I think generally, if it's very big ticket items, um, uh, most organizations have sorted that out and it works. Um, um, but in a lot of organizations that I have seen, um, something like starting with um, um, Jira in a team or starting with Trello in a team, um, those kind of things, um, um, even though it's not necessarily sanctioned by policies, um, um, teams would go ahead to do that, put it on a credit card, pull it through expenses, um, just to get started and, and get working. Um, because um, once they get legal or procurement involved, um, the process slows down so much, it's so much work, or um, it just outright stops so that they feel they can't get their work done. Yeah. Um, which, from my perspective, obviously is not an um, um, ideal position. And um, I've seen both sides of that medal from, um, um, for example, coming, um, having, running a company, uh, which I think was reasonably well organized with people going into the right direction and being brought up by a large multinational company with all those very different divisions. We actually really had to fight to get some things done, uh, especially um, uh, if, if legal, if you did something that legal wasn't very aware of. Um, so I have sympathy um, for both sides. So, um, however, I think, um, and well, I'm not sure how that fits here. Um, what I see in, in big enterprises very often is that um, um, divisions feel way too important yeah? and, and forget their purpose. Yeah. So in, in most large enterprises, um, a finance department feels very important. Um, um, and it is, but the, the purpose of a finance department in a large organization is to provide good finance stuff that's, um, that helps other divisions get their job done, um, make some money, also check some boxes that you don't lose control over your expenditures and those things, but on appropriate levels. I'm not just be the best finance organization in the world, have the most processes, um, be uncooperative or whatever. Um, no, it's their job to help um, the whole thing uh, succeed. Um, the same I see very often in uh, IT divisions. It's not, um, um, I feel if an IT division has a um, uh, purpose to just be the most secure, just select one tool. No, they should actually understand their users, what the business is trying to achieve, and then help achieve that purpose um, in a way that is acceptable on a um, risk scale, on an expenditure level, on a, a control level, that make things happen um, that they use as work. And, and I think that's what I see too often in organizations where things uh, get churned up and people really frustrated to the point that they um, leave the business or are un unhappy is, um, um, this exact, or that, that a lot of divisions should really pull together in terms of what is the common goal here. And I have to contribute something that works for the others and that supports the others um, while still keeping a level of standard um, uh, to do my, does that make any, I hope I got that across um, um, well enough in English. Um, and yeah. Okay. So, we have all made these experiences. I mean, this is an Atlassian community event, so we, we can look at Atlassian. And I have made the experience with Atlassian instances. I have two experiences in my own practice. 
you start with a 10 user license and suddenly after six months, 2000 people are using it and it has become mission critical. So in this, uh, nobody knows how, and suddenly it costs 50,000 euros a year or 100,000 euros a year. Um, and nobody saw that coming. Um, is that still a thing today that something like that happens or do you see it e earlier? Is it easier or harder to do something like that? Or to have a, a um, yeah, how, how should I put that? Um, yeah. <laughs> To, to a degree, I think it's um, even even worse um, today. Not in the extreme that you say, well, six months from uh, five to 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, th I think um, it's so easy with all the different cloud services, not just um, at Lesson. I mean, Trello, yes, Jira, yes. Um, and I think that still happens that people um, sign up for a, for a cloud instant, use it in their division, someone else, that signs up for their own cloud and, and suddenly you have um, five, 10, 15 different um, uh, instances um, all with 20, 30, 50 users um, uh, spread across quite quickly. But then others go out, um, do the same with Basecamp. Um, then um, they um, go out, oh, I, need a, I need to share my spreadsheets um, better. So they go and uh, pick up a free instance of, of Smartsheet or um, uh, uh, or Google Sheets, and um, yes, I think it's um, it's become um, a lot worse that um, a lot more of those shadow ID uh, applications um, um, are being used by um, a lot more users because it's easier and it's a lot less um, uh, technical knowledge required. You can then link them up with services like Zapier or Ift or um, power apps from, from Microsoft um, or Power Automate from Microsoft, however you like it, uh, to even exchange data. Um, so I think that that problem only um, got worse to a degree um, if you look at it from a um, IT standpoint. From a user empowerment standpoint, it's obviously um, um, much, much better. So Peter, maybe a question for you and then for Hubert. Um, I, I agree with Christian that, that's, that the user empowerment is better and it's easier to do something like that. But, but how do you handle, at, at one point you have to do two things. You have to extract the value generated and store that somewhere safe so that in 20 years you still have that source code, for example. Um, and the other role is uh, from time to time, you have to consolidate or clean up stuff that people just are not using anymore, but that still may contain, contain valuable information. And what have you seen in the world or in your own experiences, um, how that is handled? Is that a special role? Is that something that just happens? Or is that every three years, the IT head of IT department comes along and says, we have to do a consolidation program and spends millions of euros to consolidate all that stuff. Uh, how is that happening? Because that's the other, that's basically the reverse way from introducing new teams. How do you get them out of the wild again? How do you consolidate all that stuff that happens out there? Peter, if you want to start. Yeah, I'll start. Um, it's often a change management process. Once again, it's not about the tools, it's about processes and people. And like, you need to, first off, if it's a tool that's no longer being used, then you can just remove it. And if it's an, an, a SaaS tool, you can like see if you can extract the data you need from it, either through API or downloads or exports or whatever, and then simply stop the subscription and they'll, they'll delete the data. If uh, it's a tool that's kind of being used still, but not a lot, and you've got so many tools and you want to consolidate, then you start looking at a change management process. And there are several ways of doing this. One is the top down saying basically, well, now we're going to use these tool, tool stacks. We won't approve any other expenses anymore. If you still use anything else and we notice it, we'll tell you to stop using it. Please migrate. Might work, might not work. The other one is empowering your managers to figure out like, okay, what's happening? Which tools are you using? And then have them go and talk to their peers and see, okay, how can we consolidate as an org and do this step by step? And then figure out, okay, what are the actual tools being used across our different organizations? What are the actual tools being used across our different teams? Because it might be that in, in engineering, 
Trello is being used by a single team out of 100 teams. But it might be that in marketing and in HR and in finance, Trello is actually being used by every single team. So if engineering would decide, it would be, well, let's throw away Trello. But if marketing and, 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 and HR would decide, it would be like, let's just keep Trello. So you want to make sure you, you see all of these different aspects too. So there's, there's a process there. And yes, you'll need somebody to, to, to manage this. And that's going to be, that's difficult. It's always difficult. And that's where you, you need to set processes in place so this doesn't happen. You've got like, you can stretch a bit, but you don't want it to become too much of just the wild west of tools, uh, especially if your company grows. And uh, like, it's kind of like value too. Like Atlassian is famous for its, for its values. And those were set and discussed when Atlassian was 70 people strong. It was still a small company. And they still live by those values. And it's similar to how you should set your, your processes. Set a couple of guidelines in the beginning when you start your company and build up from there. But be sure to think about it because once this hits you, it's going to hit you hard if you didn't prepare for it. Hubert, how is eBay handling that? Is that a role? Is that some resident gardener who goes along the rows and checks what's still there and what can be cut back and what is happening? Yes. So uh, overall, about the tool stack that we are using, we have a team that is reviewing everything. So let's say that it's information and security department where they have a list of all applications that are used and they are also approved by them so that we are allowed to do this. So if you want to have any new tool, you need to make a request to them for their approval. And of course, as always, it's not like in the perfect world. So there are some applications that are not listed and so on. So we are still continue working on improving that um, asset management for application and tool stack. But uh, overall, we have some kind of nice processes for consolidating, migrating and archiving stuff. So for archiving, we are using the third party uh, providers of the, like for example, Botron or any other solution that uh, helps us to archive. For example, if you have all the Jira, we don't migrate to the our like main Jira, everything. So we always review what's there, what's needed, and then we move that to 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 that uh, to our main application. And the rest of it is uh, like zipped and archived on some special drive somewhere that we are sure that it's there for uh, whatever time we know. So it's unlimited time we have that like kind of, of uh, agreement that they will keep it forever. And so, so that's how it works. Also, we are utilizing now the uh, uh, public cloud for archiving. So uh, eBay has agreement with uh, Google. So, so we have a Google storage where we can uh, upload some archiving stuff, for example, the old tickets. So we have a special uh, developed by us custom uh, application, uh, like middleware, that it's fetching tickets by API, extracting them, and then storing them in the cloud, public cloud, and, and then deleting them from our instance. So we have uh, some kind of cleaning up to not like to avoid growing instance to 10 million tickets or something. So we built by ourselves and it's approved approach. And we truly believed that the public cloud is also way to go for the future. Uh, also, we have a private cloud, but but uh, I think that the, 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 it's all about the legal documents signed by companies and so on. So mostly eBay is using that companies that are specialized in archiving data and then giving us the stamp that it will be kept forever on the location of the server wherever you need. So it can be Germany for Dutch, can be Netherlands for UK, can be Great Britain data center and so on and so on. Yeah. Of course, there is a whole discussion about uh, the location of the data, where it should be. And there's a huge, like, you know, the discussion about moving data from United States now to Europe, splitting there. But it's a different topic that we can spend for next three hours, how to do that, because everybody is running around the table inside house, because it's not, in, we can't be in the office, but running around the, what we will do because of the new law and new, new uh, enforcement and so on. But that's, but that's how it is. So we have a, so the, the biggest player on the market will have a data center in every country. I think that's the future and that's it. 
so yeah, so we have a processes, we have InfoSec team that is giving approval how to do that and that they, they are enforcing the teams to, to, to follow that rules. Of course, as I said, it's not perfect work that everybody follows the rules, but at least we try and we do our best to have it like that. That also we are not bound to the one company, so we are selecting that uh, best of the market. Of course, the in enterprise level, doing the agreement with such a company, it's a long process, so it's not like that we decide for that and that's it. It's like six months for discussion, legal department going there and discussing with them, and then we have a green light. Okay. Yeah, and I can also add one thing to it. So we uh, also have like a review process in place. I mean, this is like uh, one of, or I would say the almost only possible uh, positive thing of the Atlassian uh, ABO service, kind of. So uh, we have to justify the budget every year. So we also have a budget infused, uh, say, review process where we question uh, the usage of our tools. So we uh, then go with data. So we uh, analyze what uh, macros are used, what add-ons are used, and how much they are used. And then we see the, in relation to the whole instance, uh, is it worth having that? If like with uh, 10, 15,000 users, if like 10 people use that or only like one team, uh, you can question that is, does that bring enough value? And then we ask the team, do you use it? Do you need it? Or are you just checking up on old data? And then we migrate it and maybe even drop the whole add-on uh, it's like, uh, I think also an import, uh, important uh, step to review the tool stack frequently. So not just like uh, to add new stuff, but to also question uh, the existence of tools because you don't want to end up with five different tools doing the same thing in the end. So you want to build like, or in bigger organizations, you build up knowledge bases or teams center of excellence, how, however you want to call it. Uh, and when a team wants to have something, they ask that center of excellence. So they ask these people, uh, hey, uh, do you have that? Can we have that? Or can you help us getting into that? So you have more knowledge than we do. So we ask you, what is the best step? What works? What doesn't work? So they, we build on uh, knowledge uh, grown or developed inside the org. So we ask other teams, they ask us for uh, topics we are specific uh, experts in, and we do the same for them. So that's helping us a lot. Great. Um, before I, I mean, we are approaching 7 p.m. Um, we have still seven other people in the audience. So um, six other people. Um, any questions from the audience? Anything you want to add to the discussion that we had so far? Any of your experiences? Don't be shy. Because uh, if there are no questions from the audience, I would uh, basically ask our panelists for final statements, basically. Um, what did we forget? What should be added? What is another topic that we should have discussed? Um, so going once. I, going. I have one which ah. might exceed a bit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how do you guys uh, experience uh, the effect of massive home office? So everyone's like in home office and like the shifts of uh, from being there nine to five to uh, pretty much being available all the time. So uh, that do you need to remind your uh, employees or coworkers to take a uh, shut off the computer uh, and take some time off the screen? Because the good thing is like, okay, you have like Zoom meetings for everything, but you end up like missing the day. So uh, you may just like work, work, work. And like there's, oh, there's another guy asking, you help them, you do this, you do that. And then boom, it's like 8 p.m. And you just realize, oh, you didn't have lunch. Uh, so does it happen in your teams? How do you handle it? Peter, uh, I if... can start because okay, I have a really good start. answer. So just have a kid. So my wife at six is bringing me eight. Your turn. 
and <laughs> then you don't think about work anymore <laughs> because the kid wants to go outside and getting fed and all that time so just getting kid in the hands that's it <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like nine to five in the office or even great i would say <laughs> that's cool um, i want to add on to what you were said i have four kids so yes they help <laughs> But uh, also, like, like I said earlier, I have a spread across from Sydney all the way to the West Coast and all in between. People in Europe, people on the East Coast, mid, 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 Midwest, and then the West Coast in the US. What I tell them, and you have to live by example here as a leader, is book, like, clearly mark time on your calendar as not available for meetings because you, people might not take your time zone into account when they book meetings. Say no to meetings outside of your availability. But also be flexible, understand that you are working for an international team. But this also means that you don't have to work necessarily from like 6 a.m. because you want to sync up with Sydney till 9 p.m. because you want to sync up with San Francisco. No, you can work in the morning, take a break in the afternoon, work in the evening, if that fits your schedule. It's about flexibility. It's about communication. But it's also about disconnecting. So one thing I've said that a blog post I wrote at Atlassian a couple of years ago, because I've been working remotely for a long time, is how I stopped worrying and love the silence. And I, was that, I published that one on the day I actually removed every single work-related notification from my phone. So there's no work email on my phone. There's no Slack on my phone. There's nothing on my phone except my calendar, which syncs, that relates to work. So then I can actually close my laptop, put it into my backpack or leave it in my office. If you're lucky enough to have a home office, walk out and I won't get any notifications. I won't, won't know if something is burning. And honestly, that's the right thing to do. That's the only way you can disconnect because otherwise you will be checking your email in the middle of the night. Because like you said, Frank, now it, now like there's always somebody else who can, uh, you can help. There's always something else happening. So it's, it takes, energy to, to make sure those boundaries happen. It takes practice and sometimes it just takes deleting stuff from your phone and leaving your laptop closed. Yeah, I think to that, um, um, I don't do it the same way that um, uh, Peter does. Um, so I have still have notifications and I still like to read Slack in the evening. So I have it on my phone. Um, uh, but I think what, what Peter, or the element, one of the elements that um, everyone said to decree is um, you need to, f there are multiple approaches and you need to find something um, that works for you. Yeah. And for some, I absolutely believe not having that stuff on, on the mobile phone and being able to cut off at some point is absolutely the right thing. Yeah. Um, others, um, it's more that part of um, flexibility. Yeah, I don't feel guilty going out in the middle of the day uh, to go for, for a run or to do some uh, shopping in the office because I know I'll be doing support, for example, in the evening. Yeah, um, but um, it, it only um, becomes a problem if you end up um, um, working um, too much and, and losing that kind of um, balance because um, I don't necessarily am not a big fan of this um, life is a marathon or this kind of things, but it is. Um, yeah, we're not, not sprinting and being burned out in, um, in six months time. That helps nobody. Um, but the, the most important thing is to recognize what works for you and try different things. Yeah. If you are the kind of person where flexibility works, um, then, then take and that's also what a boss and if he doesn't then ask for it um you um is ability and absolutely kids help their kids give you a certain amount of deadline and really demand 100 percent of the attention um so um that you, you have no um, but yeah for some that kind of flexible works others need much more clear uh, clear boundaries um I know of people who actually work around the block before they go uh, into the home office and they actually do their eight hours of work um, and then they walk around the block again, um, just as a ritual to finish. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing. Um, and not everyone is the same and different things um, work for different people. And that's find out what works for you. Watch yourself carefully and then um, make sure that you um, apply it. 
Okay. So, um, with that, that was a very nice excursion, a bit beyond our topic today, but that's always interesting in times like these, um, to hear from other people's experience and share the experience. So, um, final statements, summary of your impressions from this discussions. And we start in reverse order. Peter, would you like to start with a final statement and summary, what you learned, what, what's missing, what we forgot, what should be added from your point of view? I think for me, the statement is just pretty concise. All of this is not necessarily about tools. It is about processes and people and how to manage both of those. So you'll never have to manage your tools. Okay, Hubert. Oh, you took my sentence. So exactly the same. Don't bounce to the tools. <laughs> tool stack is changing, never change so fast as right now. So you have new tools every year and even like don't bounce to any Atlassian stuff and so on. So be open-minded, try the tools, new tools. Maybe they, uh, they fit better to your needs and uh, care about people and processes because that's the most important. And uh, remember about security, because that's the most important of 21st century thingy. Christian. Yeah, uh, all the same elements. Um, and seeing that from a company owner um, point of view, I think as a company, you should be absolutely open. Um, it's exciting times. There's a lot of integration that can be done. There are very cool tools around. And as a company, you should be absolutely open to it. Yeah. Don't be too strict, don't say no all the time because people will then go to any way to a degree and you'll have lost control. Guidelines and give them help that they understand why something can't be done for security reasons, for example. Uh, but support them um, if it can be done. And that way they bring back the ideas. That way they, um, you know about the integrations that you have. Um, and you're not losing the control and you're actually going to get the best of it. That's my opinion. Perfect. These are very nice final statements. Thank you all very much for taking part tonight. Um, and with that, again, thank you all. Thank the panel. Thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Um, and see you soon, hopefully in the real somewhere, sometime, somehow. Okay. Stay healthy and all the best. Goodbye, good Thank night. You. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye. See you guys. Thanks for being there. Bye bye.